Videos you create are only as effective as your strategy for getting them rolled out and promoted in the world. On this episode of The Creative Brief, I sit down with Gavin Willis of Wacom Family Farmers. Gavin's a savvy marketer who uses video strategically to grow their brand's following and increase awareness through powerful and authentic storytelling. I hope you enjoy the conversation. Gavin, thank you for being here today on The yeah. Creative Brief. Thanks for having me. Can you introduce yourself? Um, introduce yourself and your role at Wacom Family Farmers. Yeah, so I'm Gavin Willis. I'm the business director with Whatcom Family Farmers. I've been there in some capacity or another for three and a half years now, I think. Um, started out as a part-time gig doing some uh, education work and that kind of uh, expanded as I took on new roles in different parts of the work that we do. Yeah, and for someone that's not familiar with the work that Whatcom Family Farmers does, can you give us a, a brief synopsis of, of Whatcom Family Farmers and your mission, vision? Yeah, totally. Um, it's, it's kind of a, a broad spectrum of the different types of work that we do, but I mean, starting with the mission statement, um, our mission is to preserve the legacy and future of family farming in Whatcom County by unifying the farming community and building public support. Um, I think in Whatcom County, we're pretty lucky to have a farming community across a whole bunch of different sectors. We got the, the three big ones are dairy, berries and seed potatoes, but we've got a lot of small farms as well, um, some meat farms, um, vegetable farmers market, um, CSA, direct to consumer stuff. Um, but our farming community is pretty well united compared to uh, a lot of other regions. Um, you know, you're, you're farming with limited amount of, of space, you need land, you need resources, and so there can be a lot of competition. Um, but it's pretty cool to see our farming community work together and recognize that, hey, when we're working together, we're more effective. We can get things done that way. Um, and then we can focus on issues that impact all of farming. Yeah. So our work runs a gamut from education, starting with third grade students. We have a program for third graders called Farm Circle. Um, we have public education and outreach video and other digital content series. Um, and then we do some uh, outreach work at public events um, like the Raspberry Fest festival, sea feast, and other stuff like that where we can get out and meet the public and engage with them, um, answer their questions and hear their concerns. And then advocacy work as well, um, identifying public sector issues that impact farming um, and working to represent the farmers and make sure that their voices are heard. And a lot of what, you know, the work and the programs that you've described are awareness building and advocacy and how have you found, and this is where we'll get into some of the, like, where does video connect to yeah. this? Uh, how how have you found awareness building in, in your marketing and advocacy work uh, play out in your in your strategies? Yeah, I, I think it varies depending on the campaign we're working on. Um, but a lot of times I'm looking at uh, two things when we're trying to design a campaign like that. One is how do we want the viewer to react? Um, whether that's a, a visceral or emotional reaction, and then what action do we actually want them to take? So reactions can be anything. We, maybe we want them to feel um, sad. Maybe we want them to feel hopeful. Um, maybe we want them to be intrigued and, and store a piece of information, or maybe we want them to be outraged. Um, and then the actions as well. Maybe we just want them to learn something so that next time a topic comes up um, and they're at dinner chatting with some friends and someone mentions water rights on farms. They say, oh, now they have this new piece of information they can share. Um, and sometimes we want them to take um, another action. Maybe we're looking for engagement on social media. Maybe we're looking for them to call or write their legislators and express support um, or disapproval for a specific type of legislation. So I think starting with what you want your, your viewer to do um, really dictates the direction that you're going to take the campaign. Yeah, and what can, can you talk a little bit about the success? I mean, you're no stranger to video marketing. Yeah. You've done it for a long time. I'd love for you to share, you know, what are some of the success stories that you've, you've had with video? How have you been able to leverage that medium to advance some of those goals? Yeah, um, we, we see much higher levels of engagement on social media uh, using video content as opposed to just um, text or image content. Um, there, there's more of an emotional component, especially when you get faces on, sc on screen. Um, being able to, to build that connection, yeah. right? If, if a viewer sees a person and can hear their voice, see them in their workspace, um, something that they're clearly passionate about, 
um, it's tougher to get that passion to come through if it's a still image or if it's just a text post. But when you have video and you can see how much a farmer cares about what they're doing um, and the work and the hours that they put in, you're much likely to, much more likely to get the viewer on your side. And then that can, um, that can turn into conversions in a number of different ways. Um, we've seen some really successful campaigns using our legislative action tools. Um, where the initial hook, um, the initial point in that funnel is video content. Um, so you've got that first 10 seconds of the video to get someone's attention, to draw them in, and then another couple minutes to lay out, hey, here's the issue and here's why it's important. And these are the consequences if you as a viewer don't take action, and then here's the link where you can take action. And, and we've had some of our campaigns where um, we're seeing 20,000 or more uh, letters being sent to legislators, wow. um, urging them to support support farms yeah. um, in Whatcom County and across the state. Yeah, because there's so much information out there, and it, sometimes these issues aren't very accessible to people, or they just don't know, yeah, where where what the reality is here in your own backyard. Exactly, especially with some of these legislative um, and policy issues. I talked about a water rights adjudication earlier. Um, that's that's a complicated process um, and it's tough to get someone who's just scrolling through on social media um, to have the attention span to read a two or three page exposition about here's what a water rights adjudication is and here's why it would be devastating for farms. Um, most people aren't going to read past the first paragraph or two um, unless they already have that connection there. But hearing but if, that story told from a farmer's perspective and seeing them as being on their farm and seeing their product and Ab yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Then you get the emotional tug and the connection there. Um, I mean, if you look at social media and the way people consume it, you look at TikTok and Instagram Reels and all this stuff, we know that video is the type of content that people relate to most. And so if you can use that content to explain the issue, um, you're much, much more likely to get people engaged and willing to take action. Yeah. So what is, what is a successful video in your mind? Like, like when you look at... In order for this video to be successful, when we put it out, what are some of the metrics that you're looking at or what defines success for you? Yeah, I, again, that, that's going to vary depending on the campaign and what we want people to do. Some of our campaigns are just brand or issue awareness. Sure. Um, so we're not necessarily looking for conversions. Um, we're just looking to see how many people we can reach. Um, so the, the real campaign, the real video campaign, where we're highlighting the stories of local farms or farms across the state even that are um, doing work on their farms that benefits the environment, environmental practices, habitat restoration projects, um, coming up with some new technology that's going to help protect the environment. Those are just awareness builders, and so there we're looking for just maximum reach and get as many eyes on it as we can. So um, for like some numbers for context, we have, uh, I haven't checked recently, I think it's about 3,000 people following our Facebook page. So for me, a successful video in the real series would reach 50,000 people. Um, some of that's shares and reshares, some of that is boosted posts um, targeting specific areas that we're looking at. Yeah. Um, and then for other campaigns, if we're doing advocacy, legislative advocacy campaigns, we're looking for conversions and we're looking for people to reach out to their legislators. Um, and so using tracking links that can let us say, hey, what are the conversions we're getting from this video versus from our other sources? And so there we're getting, looking for um, link, link clicks and conversion through our funnel. Um, sometimes we're looking at engagement rates as well. Right. Um, we're encouraging people to share posts and we can, we can track engagement in that way as well. Um, and we can kind of compare, hey, how does a video post with a conversion link on a social media do compared to something that we're sending out via a text message tool um, or an email blast or something right. like that. And out of the whole mix, how has video performed across platforms compared to other things that you've tried? Yeah, um, conversion rates tend to be a little bit lower if you're doing video on social media, um, mainly because it's just less targeted. Mm -hmm. um, so you're able to reach a lot more people a lot more easily. Um, and so even if the conversion rate is lower as a rate in terms of volume, um, we can usually match what we would get with, say, an email campaign where we're sending it to 1,000 people or a video campaign where we're getting 50,000 eyes on it. We might have a lower conversion rate, but in terms of the overall number of people, that we're getting to take action. Um, video is usually pretty successful for us. Yeah. And video allows you to do things like track engagement over time too, right? So you can see how many people are actually seeing this message versus an email that you can see clicks and opens, but yeah. you don't necessarily know if they've 
hit your, your message or they're consuming your message, video can sometimes provide more tools for that. Yeah, absolutely. We can see like average watch time or, or where things are dropping off um, and kind of analyze our content and say, hey, we're losing people when we go into this part of the issue and we need to explain this better yeah. um, or identify that, hey, this isn't something that people care about as much as this is and this is where those engagement numbers are. Yeah, and you've been able to take that and then kind of iterate on that in, in other videos that we've done um, and within your, your strategy to come up with, well, let's change this approach a little bit. Let's make a stronger hook at the beginning or um, whatever piece of the, the video you want to adjust. Yeah, absolutely. Process. It can be kind of tricky because there's, there's so many moving parts yeah. in a video um, and so many potential factors depending on the video, depending on the issue. But yeah, um, one example that comes to mind right away is, is we identified after a few iterations of the real project that, hey, we're getting much better um, engagement. People are watching longer when there's a face that appears in the first four seconds of the video. Mm -hmm. um, and so making that change, we right away saw the results in terms of engagement. Um, people were sticking around longer. Um, when they could make that personal connection to the person that's talking versus just a headless voiceover type of right. thing. So. I remember we also did um, earlier on Facebook changed their algorithm so that the three minute mark was, you know, Facebook is going to, you know, favor those videos more than shorter videos. Yeah. So being intentional about our edit time, not pushing it too long, but still making that three minute mark so you can. Yeah, that added exposure. Yeah, totally. And there, it's it, that's just a matter of just knowing what your platform is. Um, totally. Facebook works for our target audience, but I think for a lot of businesses um, that might be targeting different demographics, you might not find them on Facebook. Um, yeah. But but knowing what works for your target audience and the specific platform you're working on, um, and that's something we look at internally too. Is hey, what other platforms, video or otherwise, do we need to be looking at? Um, YouTube Shorts, Instagram Reels, TikTok, are these things where we need to kind of expand um, our reach and try to get into some of maybe those shorter form videos where three minutes something doesn't cut it, you're looking for a, a 30 second clip mm -hmm. um, for, for exposure and awareness type of thing. So. Yeah, totally. All a part of the mix. What, um, what have you found has worked well for funding videos? I mean, you're a nonprofit, you're doing advocacy work, you don't have unlimited budgets. Mm -hmm. But you're, you're continuing to produce video, you're you know, continuing to, to prioritize that. Um, and video can be expensive. It can be a, an investment for a lot of businesses. So what are some strategies that you have found work to, to be able to fund some of these projects? Yeah, most of our video content um, ends up being as part of a specific series or a campaign we're working on. Um, and so we're typically looking for business sponsorships mm. um, to fund those projects. Uh, and the most important part there for any nonprofit funding is you need to ha find businesses and individuals that believe in the work that you're trying to do. Um, and, and I think we have that for the most part um, in the broader Whatcom County community. And so that makes that a little bit of an easier ask. Um, but then also having a, a history of results and actually having some of those metrics on hand. So that when we go to a business and say, hey, look, we want you to, to sponsor this um, and, and help fund, help pay for the video. Um, on the one hand, we can say, hey, this is something that we know you believe in and you support and we want you on board because this matters. Right. But as an added benefit, um, this video is going to reach 55,000 people. Um, we, you're going to get exposure this way and this way and, and we'll have links to this and this. Um, and, and there's specific guidelines you have to follow as far as what we can include and can't include um, for, for nonprofit sponsors. Um, but as long as we're staying within those IRS guidelines, um, we can actually make it worthwhile for the businesses that are sponsoring these projects. Yeah. Awesome. Um, what's, what's coming down the pipeline for 2022 and beyond for Whatcom Family Farmers and some of the advocacy work and some of the things that you're, you're thinking about in the marketing space? Yeah, I think um, we've got a couple of uh, campaigns, projects we're working on. Um, that we're going to have a, a stronger emphasis on video content, um, ramping up production on our real campaign. Um, there's really no shortage of stories about farmers who are doing positive environmental work. Um, it's just a matter of, of lining up the stories and getting all the ducks in a row to be able to get that on video um, and also convincing the farmers that they can be okay standing in front of the camera. <laughs> um, I think for most farmers, most people don't get into farming because they want to be on camera sure. and they want to talk to uh, thousands of people on the internet. Um, yep. They get into farming because 
they are passionate about the work and they enjoy it and they want to just work hard and do their own thing. Um, so convincing them that that's okay um, and that they can manage that um, is one step there. Um, and we're also looking at um, expanding our Real Food, Real People podcast. Um, so the host of that podcast, my coworker Dylan Honkoop, he travels around the state um, interviewing people who work in farming. Um, and a lot of that is it's educating consumers about what modern farming looks like and what those farming practices are. Um, but it's also about allowing them to build that personal connection. Mm. Um, I think for a lot of people, food in general has become really impersonal. So you go to the grocery store, maybe you use self-checkout and you never even talk to anybody while you're there. You're just picking stuff off the shelf, out of the refrigerator or freezer, put it in your cart, um, go to the self-checkout and scan some stuff, and then you go home and cook it. Um, and there aren't any people involved in that process. Hmm. Um, and so there's, there's a lack of knowledge, a lack of understanding, and, and a lack of trust between the different levels of the food system by the time it gets to your plate. Um, so giving people the opportunity to see what life looks like on a farm and also hear some of the personal stories of the people that are growing their food, that are shipping and packing their food, um, I think we'll start to re rebuild some of that trust and, and encourage a lot more local consumption. Yeah, I mean, that sounds like an awesome, it's so easy to get disconnected from that whole process yeah. in, you know, our modern times. And um, yeah, and for some, for, for kids to kind of grow up and, and get more of that experience. That's cool. Yeah, yeah, when you look at just generally percentages of people now who are directly involved in food production as, as, a, as a function of the general population versus what that was like 70, 80 years ago. Um, really not too many people directly involved. A lot of automation um, and economies of scale make healthy food more affordable than it's ever been, um, but that, that with it comes a disconnect. Um, and so being able to bridge that gap um, is, is important in helping people understand what their food is like and also gives them a reason to support farms and farmers when advocacy issues do come up. Um, I wish I could tell you exactly what our next advocacy issues <laughs> were going to be. Um, I don't have that crystal ball, um, yeah. but that's, that's, this, that's an area where hey, if we can build public support, then when something does come up and we need the public um, to mobilize in support of our firms, we, we have people on board who are willing and ready to do that. So, Yeah. Cool. Well, it sounds like you've got a pretty well-oiled machine for your marketing and the way that you roll things out and you've been very strategic. When did you get started with video marketing and incorporating video into your marketing strategy? So that'll be that'll be part one. I, part two is for someone that's in that position of, of just starting out. What are some things that you would recommend that they do? Yeah, I think I think part one for us, um, a lot of some couple of these campaigns were started before I came on board with the company. Um, so I wasn't around for all of that initial conversation. But I think it, it's kind of recognizing you kind of see in the social media space, um, whether it's, it's competitors or whether it's other organizations or businesses that you're working with, you see the posts that get the most engagement. Um, you see them pumping out shiny, well-polished content. Um, and you think to yourself, man, think about how much more enticing and compelling our stories could be yeah. if we did something similar. So that's kind of the starting point. Um, and, and I think it's pretty easy to fall into the trap of initially just producing content for the content's sake. Yep. So you see someone else has a shiny video and you know, we need that too. Um, and then you get it and you're like, okay, now what do we do with this? <laughs> um, we spent however much money on this, on this video and it looks great and, and we can put it up on our website, we can put it on social media, um, but what are we trying to do? And so that's where I think if we go back to, hey, Who's your target audience? Mm -hmm. um, and, and how do you want your target audience to re react? And what action do you want them to take? Um, and that can be part of a, a specific campaign, right. um, or that can be part of an, an awareness thing. But um, I think having a, a audience target and a distribution plan in place before you even start the filming process is really important because a lot of those things are going to end up determining the direction that the video takes totally. um, when it comes to the content, to the angles and the cuts um, and the editing process, the length. All of that stuff is going to be dictated by 
where you're going to be putting the video and who you're going to be trying to show the video yes. to. Yeah. Um, so as we've gotten a little bit better at it through the years, we've, we've become a little bit more conscious and particular about some of those details. Um, rather than coming in and say, hey, I have a cool story idea. Yeah. Um, it's, hey, we're working on this campaign, this is our target audience, and this is our distribution plan, and here's a story idea. Now let's figure out how we can make that work. Absolutely. That's well said. And I, I often say that you know, video is an extension of your marketing channels, an extension of you know, your marketing efforts. And if, you're, if you don't have that really dialed in, don't invest money in video yet, because yeah. you, you know, it's not going to serve you well. You want to have that clear plan, then you amplify that with video. And that is still just a piece of your overall strategy, but that's where you can find a lot of effectiveness. Yeah, exactly. Especially for the type of video content that we're doing, um, that's not, I use some marketing terminology, that's not really top of funnel content that we're working on. We're working on stuff where we want people to take specific action and we need to actually get them in the funnel and then show them the video and get them to continue and take action mm -hmm. from there. Um, and that might not be the case for every video campaign. There's going to be use cases um, a little bit different than what we do where that, that might be effective. Um, but I think, yeah, if you, if you don't know where you want your video to be in that funnel or, or in that campaign, um, then yeah, you're, you're probably better off getting those things figured out before you invest in video to make sure that you really get the value out of it. Yeah. Great. Um, Anything else uh, surrounding video marketing that uh, you think is that viewers would find interesting? I, I think one thing that we put an effort on um, in, in all of our marketing, but especially in video, because that's where you can see it most, is authenticity and emotion. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so for some of our content, like for the podcast, for example, it doesn't need to always be something that's super polished. Um, we, we want to see a real look at what these conversations look like, um, the situations that these people are working in. Um, so it's not always going to be a polished studio interview. Sometimes it's going to be um, sitting on the tailgate of a truck or on some upside down five gallon buckets. Um, and there's going to be ums and ahs and, and pauses um, and, a, and a five second wait because there's a barn cat climbing over the equipment while you're trying to record. Yeah. Um, and there's going to be some real emotion involved as well. There's going to be laughter um, and joy. And there's, farming's a difficult thing. There's going to be instances where there, there's some tears and some serious emotion in there. Um, and that is part of what makes video such a compelling um, marketing tool. And so if you're trying to make everything too polished and take all of that authenticity and emotion out of it, um, you're missing out on a lot of what makes it really effective. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I've been very impressed seeing the work that you're doing and utilizing video in your marketing strategies and the, the audience and the impact really that you're having in our community. Um, so kudos, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it's, a, it's a tough, um, it's tough work. There's, there's a lot that needs to be done. Um, but, but I look at it, we look at it and say, hey, this is something that's, that's worthwhile um, and worth inve investing our time and making it happen, so thanks. Yeah, well, Gavin, thank you so much for joining us here today on The Creative Brief. It's been great chatting with you, and where can people find more information about Whatcom Family Farmers? Yeah, if people want more information, uh, they can check us out on social media, um, Facebook or Instagram, or the platforms we're most active, or Twitter, um, if you use that. Otherwise, uh, check out our website, whatcomfamilyfarmers.org. Well, oh, great, well, thanks. thanks again for being here, and we look forward to talking with you again soon. Absolutely, it was my pleasure. Thanks for watching The Creative Brief. If you're interested in learning more about Wacom Family Farmers or want to see some of their videos, you can find links in the description below. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a comment. Let us know what topics you're interested in. And if you ever need help with video content, please reach out. Thanks for watching, and until next time, that's a wrap.